It's that time again. It's time for another Saturday night special where we talk about everything rock hounding related. This uh, past week, I got to hang out with a couple of my fellow rock hounding buddies, and uh, one of them gave me a pretty cool rock, which I'll show you here in a little bit. Uh, the other one gave me a broken lapidary saw blade to fix. And uh, I've been learning a lot about the process of hammering blades and all of it. It's a big, it's a big topic. <clears throat> um, I make no, uh, I'm not an expert in it. I mean, there's people that work on the big blades that are used for sawing lumber and they have like expert setups like pro uh, hammering anvils and uh, you know, they can uh, set the tension really well. They, they can stretch the blades. They can fix a dished blade. And, well, I'm not there. Um, and generally with the size of lapidary blades that we cut with, like sub 24-inch blades, financially it's not worth it to take it to somebody that's professional. If you're like 36-inch plus, definitely worth it to pay to have a blade professionally repaired. If you are lucky enough to have somebody... Uh, in your general area and you don't have to ship a giant blade well i've been working on uh kind of my own poor man's uh setup and uh i was given this 18 inch blade um and it was crashed right here i've been you know do a layout and i hammered this thing straight and i'm checking it on my uh micrometer or my micrometer uh my dial indicator and it's looking good I'm happy with where I'm at with it. And uh, it did have this kind of big gash in this. So this is a uh, vintage Lortone Panther, which you don't see many of these things anymore. And uh, this is the first time I've seen a cracked blade. So right here, this deep gouge in the side um, corresponds with this kind of faint line circled right there and that is a crack in the body of the blade i've looked at a fair number of broken blades at this point this uh you know uh, i've never seen one where we've had a crack like that so that was kind of interesting you know um i over time i'm going to perfect my kind of setup for this um you know at some point um i think i've learned enough about lapidary blades over the past year where I'm going to have like the ultimate blade <laughs> recommendation video, the three blades. I think a person needs three blades for a saw. I've gone through so many blades and I think I may have figured out a good, what, what the three blades are that you should probably have. Um, so uh, stay tuned for the top three important blades. If you're a rock cutter, you know, not everybody here is uh, cutting, cutting rocks. Um, so, uh, my buddy Ian, he gave me this rock. Now, the rock is a little not important. What's important is that white stuff on the rock. Now, that is Paligorskite. And uh, Paligorskite is a very interesting mineral. And uh, it's really only found here, uh, northeast Washington underground in the mines it's a very fragile mineral uh, at a mohs hardness of two um, and it kind of has that resemblance of wet icky paper which i kind of like so uh, i i would love to uh, get some of this myself uh you know go do some collecting up north of me and uh get some uh but it's this very like fibrous mineral and uh it's cool to have this thing that's kind of like a, a local local specialty and uh yeah have that for the collection so it's very kind of him to share that with me um as well this past week uh, i was on the rock hound podcast once again which that makes for six times on the podcast for me and uh that's a lot of times but uh you know it's fun to be able to communicate with my fellow rock hounds hanging out chatting about stuff is pretty good uh go check it out if you didn't watch it on friday um i think it was uh quite quite a good show you know um so always always a fun time when you get to uh hang out with people and chat it up about rocks
as well, I put up the video about Rockhound Resource and his scammy, shady website this past week. And I got quite the response from people. Um, a lot of people have already been there, obviously. You know, if you go look at the article on the website, which is a little bit more detailed, um, I mean, hundreds of thousands of hits uh, on his maps. You know, uh, millions and millions and millions of people are using Rockhound Resource. And uh, I see down in the comments of that video, man, it, 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 uh, it sucks to read about people using it as a resource, thinking about that they're trusting it, and then they have uh, a bad experience, you know, wasted time and gas money and all, all of that. And one thing that I neglected in that video, which I probably should have left in or and mentioned, gone in depth more on that I didn't, is the quality and quantity factor at play in that. Now, one thing I showed in that video was uh, the inventory of Washington Minerals, a bulletin number 37, uh, non-metallics. And I, I use this as a prime example um, because Things get lost when you don't describe quantity and quality. Um, now, I'm not blaming this. I'm blaming the interpretation of things like this by people like Mike, who runs that horrific website. So if we just go over here and we like, you know, we look at Quartzite, you know, um, there is a whole bunch of different occurrences here. And th there's Quartz and Quartzite. And some of the things that he listed, he, I believe he got them from, from this, or these were interpreted poorly by him, and quartzite became quartz. Now, do you know the difference between quartz, we'll, we'll go with quartz, massive quartz, and quartzite? Very different things. If you uh, think of quartz as in, Quartz crystal might be thinking of something like this, and that's great. You know, um, it has terminations. The quartz grew in an open void, generally, and produced this, uh, this structure. Very cool to see. Very cool. Massive quartz is just quartz like this. And quartzite... Here's a piece of quartzite. So when quartzite becomes quartz in your map or whatever, nobody thinks of this when you just say quartz. You're, it's a big confusing mess. There's also some localities that say amethyst okay now think of amethyst for a second just like are you, are you thinking about like crystals purple crystals um maybe you are maybe you're thinking of amethyst just like this if you were to tell me that there's amethyst amethyst somewhere in washington i wouldn't think of this exactly because this is from uh not here <laughs> and uh but uh I would think about, you know, like a, maybe a plate just like this. So often the, uh, the case is actually you have amethyst like this, amethyst and fluorite like that. If you don't say the quantity or quality, who, how do you know? How do you know? One more example, and this is probably my favorite. There is so many locations here in Washington that historically, they just say there's garnet. There's, you, if you look at these old books, these old papers and stuff that don't do a good job of describing things, it's just kind of like this general, like, oh, there are garnets here. You would think that there's garnets everywhere. And technically there is. However, the saying it like that is super misleading. And most people, maybe you think of garnets, you might think of a garnet like this. How about that whopper of a garnet? Isn't that cool? Found this in Idaho myself. So not a Washington garnet, but we have big we have we have garnets out here, right? Um, so maybe you're thinking of something like that. That's not what you're gonna find. Maybe you're thinking of 
little tiny, you know, uh, like mini garnets like this. That's also generally not the case. When they talk about garnets out here, it's usually stuff like this. Wow. That's probably not what you were thinking of, was it? It's not what anybody's thinking of. And I'm, I'm using this as like a, you know, trying to illustrate how saying garnet, amethyst, or quartz can draw in, uh, it can make you, Inter you always interpret it as the best. You're like quartz, amethyst, garnet, and not these lower quality uh, versions of it. So, <laughs> as Sarah would say, pictures or it didn't happen. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like that. I like that. It's, it's easy to um, back things, back up what you say with photos. Everybody's got a camera. It's just so hard to trust things nowadays. So difficult. And it really... Look, I have, me and Sarah, have so much fun with this whole rock hounding thing, the people, the community, going to shows, going to fun rock hounding locations, all of that stuff. It's a blast. We love it. So it's a super uh, disappointment <laughs> when people do things that guarantee that, like, other people aren't going to have fun with it. I hate it. I hate it. What can I say? I hate it. Like... You know, uh, the one thing I've never talked about here on this channel, and maybe I, maybe I should just a little bit. I'm not going to name the name. Um, before I created my YouTube channel here, there's another person on YouTube uploading rock hounding videos. And um, I left like a nice comment and I was like asking for help. And they just ignored me. <laughs> no help. So uh, I was like, well, that sucked. Like, okay, like I'll figure it out by myself, you know? And that was another big motivating factor for me. It was like, well, uh, I'm not, what if I'm the opposite of that guy over there, you know? Well, I think we're going to keep this one short and sweet this week. Um, I have a fun video coming up next week. And uh, hey, everybody. Um, I really appreciate you guys. Um, you know, it feels a little weird sometimes to say thank you to a bunch of people all at, all at once. But, like, really, um, thank you very much. Uh, this whole project and everything wouldn't exist without you guys watching the videos. Uh, the website wouldn't exist. A lot of the stuff that I do uh, wouldn't be happening. So, thank you very much. And with that, uh, I will leave this one here. And uh, y'all take care, and I will catch you on the next video.